what we'll do to start off with is um, there's a, a video which the project team has had compiled um, and we're doing this on a periodic basis as we go through that because one of the most important things with any project is remembering that there's a lot of people in the company who are involved in the project there's an awful lot of people who aren't so this is about communication it's about making people understand where we are what we're doing why we're doing it and sometimes why the, the work that they're doing it all contributes to it whilst they might not exactly see that on a day-to-day -day basis so it might not be immediately apparent so this is about putting some information out there and most of it's on our website as well so Gordon if you'd like to um, hit the button. That was the first thing that you could actually say was Western Isles coming to life. Well, operating up in the northern North Sea especially during the winter is very challenging. I've worked in FPSOs for 20 years, and to me, the cleverest part of a weather vaning FPSO is the swivel. The even cleverer bit is designing an FPSO that doesn't need one. This is the first uh, North Sea FPSO to be entirely built in China. This is one of the largest uh, structures that Costco have uh, skidded out onto the barge. So we look forward to a successful loadout today. We have now successfully achieved a major milestone in the project. We delivered it in time and we did it without causing any harm to the environment. It was absolutely tremendous. It was, we couldn't have asked for better operation. But I think key to what's happened here is building the relationship. By the end of the year, it should look like an FPSO from afar. So some really neat achievements in 2013 that build the foundation for a really successful 14. Okay, so th that's great. That's probably just should to showed you everything that I'm going to talk about in the next 30 minutes. Um, uh, there's probably not too many people from the project team come, come along tonight because most of them don't want to see themselves on video as well. That's the risk of doing these things. So let, let me first of all tell you a little bit about, about Dana. Um, we were formed in 1994. Sorry, my, my help has gone to sleep already. <laughs> Gordon? That's okay. <laughs> that was the manic nodding bit. <laughs> okay. We did rehearse that bit before. Um, Dana was formed in 1994. Um, so we, we've been around 20 years. This is our 20th anniversary this year. And I've described as recently as no longer the sort of uh, the, the toddler, but now the sort of surly adolescent. Now we're sort of getting into our 20s. Not quite sure what the party will look like this year, but tw 20 years this year. Um, we were an independent oil company based in Aberdeen. I'm glad that just happened to somebody because I remembered I haven't turned mine off either. Um, we, um, um, we were an independent oil company for most of that, but we were acquired in 2010 by the Korean National Oil Company. Um, the, the Western Isles story is actually an integral part of that because I, I guess without Western Isles, we probably wouldn't have been particularly attractive at that, at that time. Whereas Western Isles is a major project because this is something which Dana had actually explored and discovered and appraised. So having that project on our books made us quite attractive. We're about market cap, we don't have shares, you can't trade in them, but roughly $3 billion is the value of the company. Um, uh, we're quite ambitious and the ambition is to grow ourselves into a leading oil and gas company. Now, if I went around the, this room and talked to anybody who's sitting in a, an operator of a similar size, you'll probably all say the same thing, but, but this is an aspiration for us. Um, where do we work? We work in the, the Middle East. Um, we have an office in Egypt, we have offices in the Netherlands, we have offices in Norway, but our primary office is in Aberdeen and we've been based here all of that time for the last 20 years. Um, we've got about 48 producing fields, we're producing 50,000 barrels a day net to the company, you can see it just trots off the tongue without looking at the slides, and, um, but about 70% of that is based in the UK, so the UK remains an absolutely crucial part uh, of Dana's business. Um, 
where's our experience? I mentioned the fact that we have operations in the Netherlands, um, we have operations in the UK, and we have operations in Egypt. Those are our major producing hubs. Um, we've been a duty holder on Triton, which is an FPSO, and that again is a key part of the Western Isles story. It was part of the strategy for us was to, um, to gain experience with an existing FPSO. So we, we purchased the Hess interest in Bitten and became the operator of Triton. Um, that happened in 2012. Um, we now have about 15 to 18 months of experience clocked up behind us operating that. And, and yes, like everybody else, we see the same challenges in terms of aging infrastructure, access to infrastructure, etc. Um, one of the key things for us and what we're doing with Western Isles and what we've done in other parts of the company is we're looking at flexible solutions. So FPSO floating based solutions for developing assets as we go forwards. Why are we doing that? Because we see, as you look at the demographic of the North Sea, that we have aging infrastructure, aging pipelines. Um, they are going to cost more. They're going to be more problematic to maintain. So where possible, we will try preferentially move towards floating production solutions. So a little bit about Western Isles. It's a $1.6 billion project, so roughly a billion pounds. And what we're doing is we're developing two fields, the Harris and the Barra field. Um, they are down here. Now, it shows four panels on here. There are effectively four small accumulations. And what we've done is we, we discovered through 2007 and 2008 um, four, four oil accumulations near the Hudson Field, which we operate. Um, it was apparent to us that any one of those at any one time was not going to be big enough for a development. But when you aggregate the four of them together, and there is a, there's a gap in the middle where we're drilling an exploration um, well at the moment, that you have a viable development. Um, we have a Japanese partner, Sieco, they have 23%, um, but Dana holds 77% of it. So you can see we're quite heavily geared towards the project. Um, we are looking at a new build FPSO. Um, we took a decision about three years ago that, sorry, two years ago, that we would not lease the FPSO, but we would build it ourselves, we would own it. Um, again, uh, and I'm happy to go into further details in terms of personal views on leased FPSOs, but, but the model in the North Sea has some difficulties. It's a bit challenged, should we say. Um, uh, export via shuttle tanker. Um, drilling and subsea work is actually underway at the moment. Um, we expect plateau production from Western Isles at 40,000 barrels a day, and that's roughly net to Dana 30,000. So you can see that if I said to you that our production at the moment in the UK is just over 30,000 barrels a day, by the time we bring this thing online, it will double Dana's production. So it's an absolute cornerstone to what we're doing in terms of that ambition I talked about, turning us into a leading oil and gas company. Um, we expect first oil around 2015, um, and estimated field life is around 15 years. So where is it? Um, it's in the Northern North Sea. Uh, it is close to the Hudson Field, which we have operated since 2005. So it's in the sort of heartland, which we understand. Um, it's around about 500 miles, kilometers north, northeast of Aberdeen. Um, and the, the project team always find it very amusing to put this little stat on there that it's actually the same distance it is from Birmingham to Aberdeen, roughly. And, and if you haven't picked it up from my accent already, it's a Brummie accent, but there we go. So um, it's five kilometers south of Hudson, so, so it, very close to what we already know and uh, understand. And in terms of water depth, I kind of like pictures, 155 meters, I don't know about you, but 155 meters of water depth, it doesn't mean a whole lot to me. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of deep, but not that deep. And it's nothing like it. you are playing in the Gulf of Mexico. But so there's the shard. For those of you who haven't seen the shard before, I'm sure most of you have, that's what it looks like. It's actually 309 meters. Isn't it sad that I know that? It's 309 meters to the top of that. And the point is that roughly half of that is how deep the water is at the Western Isles location. So if you need a picture in your mind, that's roughly the depth of water. So when you're in London next time, have a look up at that thing and think, yeah, that's, that's what they're dealing with there. It's not that big, but it's quite a lot when you're having to, to go out there and work. So um, what I would like to say about that is it's 500 kilometers north of Aberdeen. The weather is a little rough out there at times. <clears throat> and uh, this is where I sort of pause for a second and say, there is a reason for showing this. 
Um, that is the weather which we are subjected to, as most of you who are trying to work in the Northern North Sea at the moment will be finding. We have a drilling rig which has been sat there for two months, and, and if I said it's been doing nothing, the guys would probably jump up and down. It's been bobbing around in 60-foot waves at times. And, and that's what it looks like. And the, the reason that I wanted to, to, to make that point is that we said this internally. We get, everybody gets frustrated because you have a drilling rig which costs quite a lot of money with services on it, and it's not actually doing any positive work, if you want, in terms of drilling our wells. But I keep reminding people, we've got 70 guys sitting on that thing at the moment, and 70 people who are being subjected to the, the sea conditions and the weather conditions out there. And I want, it, it's good for us, and, and if you guys haven't thought about it, I'd like you all to keep in your mind that whilst it's frustrating, running out of food and running out of water and, and actually basic amenities like toilet rolls, which they very, came very close to, that's what we're asking these guys to go through. So frustrating, but pretty nasty weather conditions. Been two months like that, pretty much, on and off. Um, okay, so that's the, the back on the script now. Timeline. So we've got a project which is going to take us roughly three years, but the story doesn't start there. The story starts back actually before this. We didn't want to put too much of a timeline on there. Somebody flippantly did say you should take it back to the Jurassic period, and that's pretty much where you go to. But <clears throat> Unfortunately, this bit on here would be kind of small if we did that. So for, for Dana, it really started around about 2007, 2008, where we acquired interest in the area. Um, and we did that because we saw prospectivity there. We saw potential where maybe others hadn't. Um, we drilled a couple of exploration wells and we found that we had three or four accumulations there. Um, what did we do with it? So the good news is you found something, the bad news is you've now got to think about what you're going to do with it. So, so Dana now has changed fairly dramatically because of Western Isles. It has had a major impact on our company. We started development studies in 2009 and this period right the way through here up to around about 2012 is trying to get the right solution, trying to decide the optimum means of bringing the oil and the gas back to shore. Um, I'm trying to find a commercial offtake, trying to find a commercial solution. So we've gone for the, the FPSO solution. Um, that was pretty much landed in 2011, 2012. Um, we gained government sanction at the end of 2012. So we've been running the execution phase of this project for a little bit over a year now. So let's call it 13, 14 months. <clears throat> in that time, we cut first steel almost straight after the turn of the year. Um, we started drilling in the middle of the year. Uh, well, we've actually got the FPSO sitting out there, and I'll show you much more about that in a little while. Um, it's not in the North Sea, unfortunately, but it is floating around, and it is ready for its next stage of the development. Uh, and then moving forwards, we plan on running through the subsea installation starting in 2014, uh, an FPSO installation towards the back end of 2015. So that's roughly our schedule. So we, we started back in sort of 2007, 2008, and the project, once the project started in earnest, will run for about three years. We will have something in the region of 80 odd people sitting in Aberdeen working on the project in our office and the roughly 80 people in China. Very round terms, okay? A little bit about the development, what does it look like? So I've told you how long it's going to take, very briefly. What does the development look like? So it's a new build FPSO. And for those of you who are um, awake and alert at this point, and I haven't sent you to sleep yet, you might notice that there's this little round thing here, which is actually an FPSO. And, and many of you, and I don't mean to be patronizing, but we've had to do quite a lot of work internally persuading people that, um, so we've gone for something which doesn't look like a ship. Uh, there's a couple of them in the North Sea already. It's good. It's, a, it's not a, a brand new concept. It's a proven concept. Um, <coughs> We have uh, a couple of subsea manifolds. We will have five production wells and four injection wells off them. Um, two, two main drill centers, one over the Harris field and one over the Barrow field. And that's the names that we've been um, given to use um, through, the, uh, through the field licensing group. Um, tied back using flow line bundles, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that, and then exported via shuttle tankers. So that's just a schematic of what it looks like. Our gas is exported via um, a manifold near the base of the turn platform, which is operated by Tacker. And again, I'll talk a little bit further about that. So that's, that's where it is in the UK, and that's what it looks like. But as with all projects, projects touch many different areas. Um, we manufacture equipment. Uh, we get equipment from third parties. Uh, 
from different locations. Um, the footprint of the project is, is much larger than most people think about. They, we tend to get asked the question about, well, what's the UK content? Or, well, and we are building an FPSO overseas. So how much money are you putting there? But what I'm trying to show here is that if you think about it globally, um, we are getting equipment from pretty much everywhere. And this is only a small subset of the, all of the equipment we're getting for the project. Um, so China is a big, um, a big focus of attention for us. Um, I didn't mention the FPSOs being built in China, did I? Did anybody remember I said we're part of the Korean National Oil Company as well? So can you, can you imagine how that conversation went? Mm -hmm. the, the biggest shipbuilder in the world, and, and you're going to own it and build it, and, and, and actually, you're going to build it where? So it was kind of an interesting conversation, and, and to their absolute credit, when we showed them the, 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 the commercial, the economics for the project, they kind of looked at it and went, yeah, it's a fair game. We, there's, I'd have liked to have built it in the UK, to be honest, but anyway, we've gone to China. So we're building the FPSO in China. Um, a big focus for us, um, certainly around the, um, uh, the UK, uh, and these large blobs are, are, are intended to show roughly where the activity and the size of the spend, if you want, for the project is. So whilst the perception is, oh, you're building in China, you're putting a huge amount of work there, actually, of that $1.6 billion, about a third of it sits here. The rest of it sits mainly through companies who are based here. And I know that, for example, I know there's some of the sub-C7 guys in here, so you'll be well aware of that. A um, lot of work going through there. Um, we have um, pipe being built and um, being manufactured in Argentina, um, so Buenos Aires. Um, we have equipment, actually, that's not marked on here, being manufactured in Canada. And if we go down here, there's a whole list of companies, and I hope for anybody in the room, if you work for one of those companies, you've got a name check there, um, and I'll mention a little bit more about them later. But the footprint is pretty much global, and any major project has that footprint. And that, that, whilst that is uh, kind of exciting at one level, it's actually quite challenging at another, because not only do you have to make sure that you have all of this equipment being delivered from a myriad of different vendors on time, on budget, etc. but quality is a huge thing for us. So we have to ensure that what we get is what we're expecting. And again, I'll talk further about that. Okay. So, um, let's move to the subsurface a little bit. Um, I am an engineer, I'm not a geologist or a geophysicist, so I'm not going to embarrass myself by talking too much geology here. Um, however, um, we, we have two fields, Harris and Barra. We have P50 reserves, roughly of 46 million barrels, and there is some exploration upside in the area. Um, if you talk to our management, it's not as much as they would like. Um, never is. But from our point of view, that there is additional volumes which we think we can bring across that, so there are, there's additional potential. Um, we have shot new seismic um, across the area, and we are looking at interpreting that. Um, that was shot in 2011. We've already used it to complete the subsurface work for our northern drill centre, uh, and they're now working on the southern drill centre. Um, it, it is a Brent reservoir. Um, this is probably pretty small, and, and I kind of like pictures on slides just to give you something to look at. Um, but the intention with this is to show you that um, we have four main panels here, and they step down quite significantly. So the Lewis panel, which is the, the larger one here, is considerably shallower than Barra, which sits down here and is this panel here. So geologically, we, well, I don't know about geologically, but we're certainly getting deeper as we go through in this direction. Okay. Well designed. Um, like I said, I'm an engineer and my background is actually way back somewhere in the wells. And, and I like to keep things nice and simple. Um, experience has told me that the more complicated we make them, the, the more chance there is of something going wrong. And, and if there's any well engineering, well designed people in, in the room, I do apologise, but that's my prejudice. Um, I like to keep it nice and simple. Um, we are, however, though, drilling slim hole, high angle and horizontal wells. So I guess that's pretty routine these days, but again, um, we have drawn on experience from our Hudson field, which is nearby. This is the sort of design that we have in most of those wells. They're all Brent Reservoir wells, um, so it's tried and tested. We are not looking at doing anything for the first time. Again, I, I, I don't like breaking boundaries. It, it, it's, it's fine, but for companies the size of Dana, use tried and tested technology. I, I'm not into research and design on a project like this. Um, we will use sand screens, um, and all of the wells will need gas lift pretty much from day one. It's reasonably under pressure. 
On the drilling front, so I showed you some nice pictures of the drilling rig. This is what the drilling rig looked like in dry dock. And I, I think for the guys, they probably preferred it when it was sat there than bobbing around at the, as it is at the moment. Um, <clears throat> other than that, we probably wasn't doing too much productive for our project at this particular time as well. However, um, what we did do, we have a, we have a drilling rig um, contract with Diamond um, Offshore. Um, we drilled the, we've contracted the Ocean Nomad for two years. Um, the reason it was in dry dock is it had its um, five-year survey and we did an annual overhaul in the, in the dry dock in Hartlepool before it went on to contract. Uh, and you can probably imagine the conversations which went on internally about, are you sure you really want to do this? Is this smart, taking a rig? You know, are they going to get through all the work? Um, one thing I'd like to say, the guys from Diamond did a fantastic job. In the about 60 to 70 days after we brought it on contract, we had virtually no downtime on that rig. Um, and occasionally things were just in time, as they always are, but absolutely no problems in terms of operations. And that was a big plus. So for me, it comes down to, if you're gonna do things properly, you have gotta plan them. And we put a huge amount of time and effort into planning to make sure that that went well. So the, the time and money invested in getting, in getting that plan sorted and having the conversations first pays dividends. And that's a, a common theme through any project. Again, it's not rocket science. Um, and, and Gordon has decided to move me on because I'm clearly talking too much. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I'm sure I had something more crucial to, to share with you on that particular one. But um, So in terms of the subsea development, um, what we have is uh, a couple of bundles. Um, the, the, um, each, of the, each of the manifolds will have uh, the provision for eight wells to be drilled around them. Um, we will have a couple of eight inch production lines, a gas injection, uh, a water injection, sorry, and a gas lift line to each manifold with control power and chemical umbilicals. Um, what we're doing at the moment is we have a, a, an EPC contract with Subsea 7. All of that work is ongoing at the moment. Um, we have trees. One of the first contracts we placed with was, was with FMC for the trees. Um, we have all of those trees delivered and actually I think we now have four of them on the seabed. They're all horizontal trees. Um, subsea controls, Acker Solutions, um, and there we go. So these are the four wells. This was um, sitting in a nice little row in the yard and that was before they were all nicely installed on the seabed. Okay. Um, so I said we have uh, a couple of eight inch lines, we have uh, a water injection line, a gas lift line and control and power umbilicals to each manifold. And we decided to go for a bundled pipeline solution. Now, why did we do that? Um, probably the main reason for us was ease of installation. Um, we felt that this was the optimum solution for the project. And the second thing for us was that um, we were concerned in terms of weather windows. So we wanted to make sure that we had a solution which we could take out there and lay because uh, it, 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 as quickly as we can do because we knew the weather conditions and the sea state around Western Isles. If you, if you look at the Met Ocean data, it's, it's described as chaotic, and, and that's genuine, that's how it is described, because you, have, you are effectively north of Shetland, so you are um, exposed to Atlantic swells. You have the, sea, the, the wind and the waves coming up the North Sea, and, and they, they meet in that sort of area north of Shetland, and frankly, it's a little difficult to actually determine what's going on. So remember that pictures I showed you? For a lot of the year, that's the type of weather condition that you can actually expect um, and for us it increases the flexibility and it de-risks the project these are just some pictures sitting around here for those of you who I'm sure most of you do but if you if you're not aware of what a bundle looks like this is it's a library picture it's not one of ours they're not built yet <clears throat> but this is what the bundle looks like so you will have all of your main production and injection lines control umbilicals and it all goes inside this carrier pipe here this yellow thing um, installed with a tow head um, and literally held at one end, held at the other, uh, towed out. I, was, I always think it's a, an interesting description where it's floating. It's, it's sort of floating, but about 60 or 70 feet below the, the sea level and then placed on the seabed. Um, and I mentioned Buenos Aires. That's our pipe sitting in Buenos Aires. Uh, you'll notice it looks considerably nicer weather conditions there than it does in any of the other slides, which I'll show of here or the North Sea. Okay. Um, what else have we done? So um, I, I talked about the footprint of a project and um, a project is as good as all of the people who help you with it, all of the companies that you contract with. Um, so we, I mentioned we have contracts with Sub-C7, I mentioned FMC, I mentioned ACA. Um, so those are your you know, supply chain that most of you will be familiar with, but 
I mentioned infrastructure earlier, and I said that we are exporting our gas via the turn platform or the base of the turn platform. So sometimes not only are we reliant on the supply chain in the traditional sense, but we're reliant on what other operators do for us. So in this particular case, um, we have um, an isolation valve structure which was placed um, in uh, summer of 2013 near the base of the turn platform, and this work was done by TACA. And again, we have to work ourselves into their schedule um, and I have to say, it, it, candidly, it, it was a concern for us and a risk for us. They've done a fantastic job. And this was probably the first piece of kit. Well, it certainly was the first piece of kit on West Niles which was installed. So, uh, and we have more coming through this year. And um, I can't speak highly enough for the, the, the help that we've had so far. Okay. Um, so now let's talk about an FPSO. Uh, and I mentioned that um, the FPSO is the Savant design. It's a round one. So... Um, Somebody flippantly said, well, who needs a pointy end? Um, not us. Um, well, other, other than we have this thing here, I suppose you could point at that one. That's the flare. Um, it's a Savan 400 series FPSO, so it has 400,000 barrels of storage. Um, I, I mentioned it's a, it's a novel, but it's a proven design. We're not, we're not doing anything for the first time here. There's a couple of 300 units um, sitting out there, one of which is on a field that Dana is a partner in, so we have direct experience of, of the working conditions and how this thing behaves. So were we taking a risk? No, I don't think so. Um, it, it's proven to be very stable in the North Sea environment and certainly um, all of the information we've got from the motion characteristics and for the guys in particular who are working on this, they like it, it's a stable platform. It's not the answer to everything, but it, it works pretty well. Um, we will moor it using 12 anchors. Um, we have uh, a mixture of chain and polyester rope and these little cutaways here are actually for the mooring chains. Um, and for us, I, I mentioned earlier that um, we took a decision to buy and own the FPSO uh, rather than leasing it. Uh, and I said that I, I, I believe, uh, and I'll, I'll be very clear that it is a personal opinion, that the lease-based solution for, certainly for the North Sea, ha is slightly challenged, should we say. And the reason for saying that is that all of the solutions, and I have done lease-based FPSOs in the past, but all of the solutions that I've seen um, find during the initial period where you have your five years, six years, seven years minimum contract period. But when you get towards the late years um, of producing um, what are relatively small fields in the scheme of things. Um, and the vessel owner will typically, and the vessel owner, by the way, is, in the lease solution is not the operating company, and they're going to want to take that somewhere else because they're generally able to get higher lease rates from it elsewhere. Um, clearly what we want is to keep it on the field, producing at relatively low oil production to get that tail end production. There's a lovely phrase in Syrian Woods review which you may well have seen you probably all have heard of obviously which talks about maximizing economic recovery and my assertion is that the lease based solution absolutely does not maximize economic recovery and certainly from a corporate point of view that was a position we took and i think it's something that as an industry we're going to have to grapple with um, so there you go that's the fpso it is round um, it's a savan 400 concept um, where are we so um, the, the FPSO has been fabricated in China. We are using Costco. Um, they are um, a main subsidiary of the China, and I, I always have to read this bit, the China Ocean Shipping Company. Um, it's not, not to be mistaken with the one at West Hill that we often go out to from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> And I have made that mistake when I've seen emails coming through thinking, why is somebody sending me an email? And right, I get, somebody actually looked at my screen earlier today and wanted to know, was it you? No, it was, it was, it was our project manager who wanted to know why I was getting a mess, uh, an email from the Chinese. And it wasn't, it was Costco at West Hill <laughs> telling me I can buy a nice TV for you know, a great knockdown price. Um, they're a, bit, they're, they're a big company. Uh, the yard which we're using is new. Um, they look very different for any of you, those of you who exper have experienced working in UK yards. These things look very different. Um, the facilities are, in most cases, newer. Um, Costco has seven yards. It has a huge dock capacity of about 1.8 million tonnes. And, and you can see the area there. I'm going to read the stuff. Just under six square kilometres of space. Um, the yard is pretty busy. When we first went there about... I think the first time I went there was about three years ago. This was a new yard. There's pretty, nothing, pretty much nothing in it. I will show you some photographs of what it looks like now. And you'll, I think you'll see the difference. Um, they have already built three Savan drill ships. Um, and in fact, that is one of the guys sitting there. 
Um, these are larger units, they're 650,000 barrel units if they were used for storage and they've been delivered for the Brazilian market, I think, in every case. Uh, my understanding is each one was delivered on time and on budget. Uh, and those are words which we always like to hear. Um, certainly I do. Um, we built the, the, the blocks in um, a second yard in Nantong, and that, that work is now 95% complete. So we're pretty much through the, the building block stage um, for the hull itself. Um, and we will then do the hull outfitting and construction, uh, sorry, in the top size construction at a couple of other yards, one at Nantong, sorry, one at Chidong and one at Bomesk. Uh, why didn't we do them all in the one yard? Well, there's an awkward bridge between the two, and unfortunately, if you try and transport something of that height or what our FPSO will look like, and, and a few other companies have found this problem in the past, by the way, that it, when it sort of goes under the bridge and doesn't fit, then, well, I'd be looking for a new job at that point. So, okay. Um, so where are they? Um, they're on the east coast of China. Um, this is Bohai Bay up here. Um, so Beijing is sitting up here. Um, this is Shanghai. Um, Costco, uh, Nantong and Qidong are, are literally on the outskirts of Shanghai. I mean, I, I flippantly said that Nantong is a small city in China um, with about a population of six million. <laughs> yeah, no. And when you go there, it, it actually looks like a building site. And I, I, I don't mean, for those of you who've seen building sites in holidays in, you know, when you've gone to Spain and the rest of it, this thing, they are just building like there's no tomorrow. And you go to the, the, the hotel and, and you find you're on the 80th floor and you're looking up at it. It's, it's, it's impressive what's going on. Um, so, uh, small city inland China and Qidong is actually literally on the outskirts of Shanghai and it's on the northern side of the Yangtze River. Um, I mentioned we have a, <coughs> a large team. We have uh, about 80 people in China, um, mainly now at the Qidong site because that's where the focus of our attention is. And our modules are all being built up here at Bomesk and they will be then shipped down to Qidong where the integration for the top size with the hull will take place. Um, Bomesk is, um, a, we've, we said it's a, a Western style fabrication subcontractor. They've done a number of modules for Western companies. Um, and again, they were a cornerstone for us because we were aware that um, putting a whole FPSO into the Chinese market is, um, did I say we don't do things for the first time? Actually, I don't think anybody's done that before. Maybe strike that from the record. This might be a first. Um, so bone mask for us is, is key because we know that, it's certainly in terms of the top size, that they have experience of doing this and they deliver a quality product. Um, we have to date spent, um, expended just over 1.6, I think that actually should be 1.8 million man hours if I'm really up to date. Um, and we've done that in the yard completely LTI free. And, and it's a really interesting observation that, um, and I've, I've made this comment at a couple of presentations when I've done this, that, that everybody focuses on, you're going to China, it's really not that safe, is it? Well, you know what guys think again? Um, they may do things slightly differently, but one of the most refreshing attitudes that we've seen with the, the Chinese yard was when you go in and you start talking to them about what our expectations are on safety. Their expectations are actually very similar. They just don't maybe have the same systems and processes we have. And their attitude was, well, that's great. So we're going to put a couple of safety advisors in. They said, fantastic, and you can help us learn. And, and, and that's why I would warn anybody, if you ignore the Chinese market, do so at your peril, because these guys are great at learning and copying. So 1.6 million man hours, LTI free. I am not being complacent, because you know what? We could have one today. So that's why we put our people in there. And, and I would say that our advisors are making um, a, a huge change to what we have seen in terms of those health and safety procedures, but by no means am I suggesting that they were not doing things safely before. We spent a lot of time looking at this before we actually put the contract there. We've had no high potential incidents. In fact, ironically, the one incident we had was in the North Sea, and it was related to work practices and weather conditions. So, so again, I, I share with you just a slightly different perspective. Let's, let's not all congratulate ourselves because what we do here is, is great and everywhere else is not. That's not the case. These places work and they work very safely. Um, the next set of slides, um, there's quite a few slides here and, and I use these um, particularly with uh, internally 
to try and get into people's minds what the FPSO process, the fabrication process we go through, looks like. Um, and what we've now been able to do is intersperse these when they were um, animation, if you want, and we've managed to intersperse these with what some of the, what the vessel actually looks like now. So the first thing we do is we lay the keel, and those are effectively the bottom blocks for the vessel, and, and the keel looks like a dumb piece of steel, um, it's actually a very important piece of kit as far as the savan unit is because it gives it stability. Okay, um, we laid the keel, so we cut steel um, towards the end of January on the project, and we laid the keel in Qidong on the 28th of May, and we had a keel laying ceremony there, and they put on a 55 course banquet or something like that. And, <laughs> I used to look quite a little bit slimmer there. I'm not quite sure that dapper guy is taking, taking control of the red horse, which they gave to us. Um, but um, it's a big thing. Loads of fireworks, get people over there, and it's all about building relationships. And again, it's no different to what we do here. For me, any project, in fact, anything we do in life is about building relationships. And it's about building long-term relationships. It's what these guys want to do. It's what we want to do. And it's what we try and do with everybody who we work with. Okay? Um, we then start building up from the keel. So um, keel down here, and we start building up. This is around about a six metre height um, at this point. And you can see that we're starting to see the base of the FPSO taking shape. And you're beginning to see what the cargo tanks look like with the ballast tanks on the outside here. These are the fair leads for the mooring system. Okay. And actually, this is what it looked like. So there's a series of photos here, which we'll just step through. So this is effectively the keel laid, and you can see that they're already starting to build up. And this was, this was actually quite scarily soon after the 28th of May. So when we arrived there on the 28th of May, there was one block sitting in this rather large area here, nothing else. I think that these, I can't remember the date, but I think this is about September time from memory. Um, and then as we move on, and that is pretty much what it looked like around about December. And that's the point at which it was floated out. Um, so you can see that this, this has been built from a standing start um, in January to up to about the top level, main deck level by the end of the year. And it's a pretty impressive feat. Um, that's launched, so the hull was launched on the 18th and 19th of December and it's launched, it's taken offshore on this barge and then I, I always try and get this right, when I say the barge is sunk I don't mean they, it's disposable but it's submerged and then the hull is floated off and there it is. So that's the hull floating around about the, the quay in Qidong um, week before Christmas. Um, thankfully a couple of tugs holding it on station. Did you anybody notice, notice that I said before that the yard was pretty much empty about three years ago when I first saw it? And I'm not going to ask you to go back, Gordon, but if anybody noticed, did you see that there was a big thing being built in the middle, but there was a heck of a lot of work going on around the outside as well. That yard is full now. Um, so up to the main deck level, um, caissons installed, mooring systems installed. So these are the winches on the top, fair leads here, um, cargo pumps for, and seawater lift installed. Um, nod <laughs> okay um, and this is just a cutaway showing that um, inside of here you, you've got the pipe work you've got the ballast system sitting down here and we've now got the risers being installed um, so major packages we, we have four major top size packages um, for the process kit um, and uh, the gas turbines are inst installed here that'll be one of the first lifts on um, water treatment module now on the process side um, separation module should, be go, should go next, separation and pigging modules here, um, gas compression installed, um, flipping back onto the, um, the safe side if you want, um, these are the services blocks going in, being installed, um, living quarters, <coughs> a couple of cranes have gone on at this point, lifeboats, free fall lifeboats here and a heli deck, simple, there you go, that's how you do it. See me afterwards if you want lessons. The dry tow is quite challenging though. So having built the vessel, and um, we then have to get it round to the UK. Uh, we have to go through the Straits of Sumatra. Um, that, from a security point of view, that's quite challenging. Uh, and we have to come around the Cape Peninsula. Somebody did ask me, how long did I think it was going to take to bring this thing around Cape Horn? 
and I said actually significantly longer than we expect to get it to the North Sea because that would be really a long way around. Sorry for those of you who are not, your geography is not that good and mine wasn't brilliant. That's the Cape of Good Hope. Cape Horn's down here. So take it around the tip of South America. Well, fair enough if you want to, but you know, if that schedule has now just gone out to the right a bit. Um, transferred to wet toe in the North Sea. Um, and it'll take about 40 to 60, 45 to 60 days. And, and when are we looking at this happening? This should be around about the mid to the end of 2015. Um, so we're looking for this thing to be delivered to the North Sea in 2015. Key things for us are schedule is always important for us. Um, cost is always important for us. But one of the most important things for me on any project is quality. If we get hung up on the first two, and we've had this conversation on many projects I've been involved in, you can have it cheap and you can have it quick, but if you get rubbish at the end of the day, then nobody's going to be happy. So for us, we're going through the balance right now in terms of cost, schedule and quality. Um, and what we want to do is make absolutely certain that this thing is delivered to the North Sea, it is fully commissioned, it works, and we don't have to take it into a fjord for rework. Now, I, if you invite me back in three years or two years' time <coughs> and it's sitting in a fjord in Norway, actually, I'll probably have a different company name at that point. So um, that's what we're focusing on. So, so at the moment, and, and uh, I know that um, if, if, I, if I had our chief exec in here, he would probably shoot me for saying this, but I am not focused on the schedule right now. And I think we should be focused on making sure that this thing is delivered and right first time. It's of much more value like that. Things to be aware of. Uh, I talked about the Chinese market, I talked about safety a little bit, and I said, yeah, great on the safety side. We have always been focused on quality. And we know that there are some challenges in the supply chain in China and uh, certainly in a number of Asian countries. And again, if there's anybody who is from that area, I apologise, it's not meant as a criticism, it's a fact of life and we deal with it. We have our problems as well. Um, what we, what we focused on is starting off with welding. So we're building the hull. What is the first thing we're going to do? We're going to be welding rather large blocks of kit and it's, and it's rather helpful if they don't leak and those welds held out. So we focused very much on welding and we've done a high level of weld inspection. Um, don't ask me what the numbers are because I can't remember exactly what percentage, but quite high. Um, ATEX, we know, we looked at and said, okay, what have other, what have other FPSO problems have been? So Dana has been involved in um, certainly one of the projects, the, uh, I'm not going to mention it, where it had ATEX problems. Um, and it did spend quite a lot of time having rework on it. So again, it, the, the, the lesson for us here is look, look at what has happened in the past. Look at the history. Look at where other people have had problems. Learn from them. Don't replicate them. Try not to make your own problems as well as you go along, but certainly make sure that you look at what other companies have suffered from. Uh, and then PED and traceability. One challenge for us and for, for a lot of companies is um, piece of equipment, uh, certificate, great. You know, everything matches, all the numbers match, but actually the reality is they, they're not for the same piece of kit because this one isn't real. So we have spent a lot of time making sure that what we did was we managed our Chinese supply chain. We went through an approved vendor list process and we said for any piece of kit, we want names of companies who we have effectively audited and approved. Um, three companies minimum for every single piece of kit. And that's how we've managed the, Chinese, the, the, the vendor list in China. Um, now, what that does is that, that sets a, a, a line in the sand and then we can start. If we've had to, we've relaxed that. But we've had that conversation. So we've, try, we've tried to control where equipment has come from at every step of the project. Um, what else has been interesting for us? The UK Border Authority. We've all probably heard about them recently. Um, uh, that's actually been kind of interesting because this was a hidden little thing which sat there and so we, we put work in China and these guys have then contracted work to various parts of the UK, various parts of Europe. It is really not easy for these guys to get over there and inspect it and do the package management. So again, something which we've had to pick up on and be aware of. Uh, and and I, if I'm candid, that's something that we still are managing now. Um, and then the last bit, and I, and I mean this very seriously, Chinese New Year is a big deal. And, and everyone sort of looked at me and gone, yeah, really? So, so tell me something I don't know. But I don't think a lot of people who actually got involved in this at the start realise just how big a deal it is. And um, there was stuff on the BBC website recently. I think they were talking about 1.8 billion journeys, was it, around Chinese New Year. That's just in China alone. And the reason I say it's a big deal is that, is that these guys travel large distances. It's, it's like having two Christmases a year. We have the Christmas and New Year bit, and then 
there's an exactly equivalent thing around Chinese New Year. And these guys travel long distances to go back and visit with their families, probably more so than we do. That's maybe a subjective statement. And, and in some cases, the guys, they go to better jobs or they go to different jobs or they don't come back. So you end up with a little bit of retraining after Chinese New Year. And we, there was an interesting stat put out there. Um, and I, I can't remember if the, if the number is exactly right, but, some, but, but we were told, and this was by the yard, this, the start, they said somewhere around about, uh, I think they said 40%, but that may be slightly exaggerating, but certainly around about the 20% plus, just don't come back after Chinese New Year. So you then have to go through the process of bringing people on again, and an ed education process, I didn't quite mean it that way. Um, t you, you, have to, you have to make sure you get skilled workers back. So I say it's, it's a big deal, and I mean seriously, it is, it is really a big issue. Um, the, the, last, the last bit on that previous slide, which Gordon's moved me on for, and that's okay, um, but, it, but it, was, um, it was a comment at the top and I wanted to come back to it. And this is kind of a mantra for me, expect what you inspect. And that was, Tim, who's our project manager, I think, came up with that one and it really struck a chord with me. And, and, and certainly right now managing the Chinese supply chain, I think that's very important. So if you've got any concerns at all, you make sure you inspect it and you inspect a lot more than you might have done. And, and that's, that's if you want the best guarantee that you can give yourself, okay? Um, we're coming to the end now, don't worry. Uh, preparing to operate, so what have we done? We, we've, we've got the project and the project is now up and running um, and we now have a project team, um, an operations team sitting with the project team. So we've got guys who are now beginning to look at the commissioning side and we've had that for, for a wee while and we're now looking at building up our operations team because I said that Western Isles is, is important to Dana. We have certainly one FPSO operation at the moment. We're going to add a second one to it and what we want to make sure is that we integrate that as seamlessly as we can do into it. Um, again, um, this is just good practice but I thought I'd put some mug shots and try and make this real because um, we talked about loads of pieces of kit, so let's talk about some people. We've got um, a team of guys who we're bringing in, and we've got a transition manager, and we've got a couple of OIMs, and we are trying to, to, to uh, use the experience we have in-house and certainly transferring some of the experience from our other overseas assets into, into the team. So, um, where shall I leave it? The, the FPSO is really easy, and I, I wanted to give you give you a thought that it's, it's 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 kind of as easy as counting, but backwards, if you like. And for those of you who are a bit long in the tooth in this room, you might remember Thunderbirds, but it's it's as easy as five trees, four modules, three years on the schedule, two mod two sub C manifolds and bundles, and one FPSO. It's one billion dollars. It's one project. And that's what we're doing over the next two to three years. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for coming out in the horrendous weather. It wasn't raining quite as bad when I came in. If you've got any questions, I'll be happy to try and take them. Thank you. SP Aberdeen. George, thank you. And um, we'll... Anyone who has questions may be able to interact with Paul after this. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.